Good evening. Thank you for joining Gwinnett County Public Library for our Writer's Law Workshop featuring attorney and author Jody Millman. My name is Miriam Mayer and I am an Adult Services Specialist at Gwinnett County Public Library. Now I would like to introduce our guests for tonight. Jody is a lifelong resident of Poughkeepsie, New York, which serves as the setting for her legal suspense novels. In addition to being the award-winning author of The Midnight Call and new thriller, Hooker Avenue, Jody has been an attorney for more than 40 years with practical experience in intellectual property law. She recently created the educational program, The Writers Law School, which educates writers and artists about protecting their legal rights in a fun and easy to understand way. Jody received her BA and JD from Syracuse University, concentrating on law and literature. Jody obtained her MA in English Literature from Eastern Michigan University and has taught at Detroit Mercy Law School and Marist College. She currently co-hosts and co-produces the backstage with the Bardavon podcast. Please welcome Jody Millman. Hi, Miriam. Nice to see you. And welcome everybody who's uh, joining us. I can see there are quite a few of us. Well, welcome to the Writers Law School. Um, as Miriam told you, it's a, it's a fun and educational way for writers to learn a little bit about the law uh, without having to go to law school. In tonight's program, we're going to discuss intellectual property, copyright registration, and the case, the new case law, fair use, public domain, defamation, and publishing contracts. Now, exactly what is intellectual property? Intellectual property is really a catch-all phrase for artistic works and scientific innovations that are entitled to governmental property. They fall into three categories, copyrights, patents, and trademarks. What is the difference and how can we protect each and every one of them? Well, first of all, as writers and artists, we're interested in copyright. We're all familiar with this little C with the circle, that's called the copyright belt that protects original works of authorship. And if you think about it, that's a very broad category. It protects things like literary works, film, musical works, poems, sound recordings, broadcasts, paintings, blogs. I mean, anything that you can think of that is an original work of, ownership, uh, of authorship. And it's protected by US Code Title 17. Now, who is a copyright owner? The copyright owner is the artist or the author or the person who originally comes up with the work. Now, one thing I want you to remember is that from the moment, if you're a writer, you put your pen to the paper, or the moment that you're, if you're a painter, you put your brush on uh, whatever medium you're working with, you are automatically the owner of the copyright and the author. The exception is if you are work for hire, and we're going to talk about that in a couple of minutes. But I, but I have to warn you that merely coming up with an idea does not make you an author. Um, and as you can see, some of these drawings, I took a class a couple of years ago on copywriting comic books. So I'm going to be incorporating some of these wonderful slides into my presentation. Now, what is a copyright and what are the rights that are included? Well, first of all, it's the right to copy. That means if you write a poem or you write a book, you have the right to go to the printing shop or print it off your computer. You have the right to distribute it, you know, to bind it and sell it, or to engage a publishing company to go ahead and do that for you. If you are, have written a play or you um, have a poem or a short story you want to read, you have the right to publicly perform that work. Similarly, if you're an artist, you can display it. If you, you're in a gallery or you know, on the internet, you have the right to publicly display it. And finally, derivative works. And I'm going to explain what that is right now. A derivative work is any type of artistic work which is really secondary to the original underlying work. Think of, think of your original work as a tree and the derivative works are the branches going off of that main trunk. In this particular situation, you see we have our copyright golem. From this golem, this little figurine, we can make a comic book. 
a movie, a TV show, a video game, or a toy. So you see, it's a right that grows out of the original underlying work. Now, one thing I have to caution you, and I, I mentioned this before, just coming up with an idea doesn't make you an author. And that's because ideas are not subject to copyright protection. I always like to refer to Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet as a classic example of an idea that has morphed and into other works that are subject to copyrightability. Well, first of all, we know the underlying story is about the two star-crossed lovers, Romeo and Juliet. Now, over, the, over time, going coming back from Shakespeare's time to the present, people like Leonard Bernstein have incorporated that trope into West Side Story. Similarly, Twilight, about a vampire and young teenage girl who fall in love. They're star-crossed lovers. Anyone who's a fan of Diana Gabaldon's uh, Outlander series understands that you've got two star-crossed lovers who literally go through time to, to get together are star-crossed lovers. That underlying idea is not copyrightable. However, the writer's unique interpretation of that story is. Now, one thing I want to tell you that I think is really important to understand that websites are not copyrightable, but the artwork, the essays, the photographs, the videos, the content that you create and post on your website is subject to copyright and protection. You should put a little C with a copyright on it to make sure that no one, no one steals your work when you, when you distribute it on the web. Now, one thing that I mentioned that from the moment you create your work, you're entitled to copyright protection under the law. And that lasts for the life of the artist plus 70 years. So keep that in mind if you have an estate. Those your copyrights, if you, you go ahead, they something that should be left and mentioned in your will because they certainly last 70 years beyond the author's life. And no registration is required in order for you to have a copyright. However, I do recommend that you do register your copyright. And where you register it is at www.copyright.gov. Now, what are the benefits of copyright registration? Well, first of all, it's public notice of your ownership. The moment you register it, there's a database on the uh, copyright.gov website. So your name becomes listed on that website as the owner of your property. And merely having the certificate and registering is legal evidence of your ownership, and which indicates the validity of your rights in that particular piece of, uh, of literature or art or poem or photograph. Now, it also entitles you to bring an action for infringement. You cannot go to district court to, to assert your rights unless you are registered with the Copyright Office. It also entitles you to the maximization of damages. You'd be able to collect your costs, your fees, your attorney's fees, and other costs and interests um, if you are successful. But not all of us are JK Rowling. We can afford to go to, uh, to, to district court because it costs 500 bucks just to get started in district court. District court is slow, it's expensive. You're gonna to have to hire an attorney. So what happened was in the 2020 um, COVID relief bill, uh, in that 5,900 page document, the Copyright Office slipped in what's known as the case procedure, which is a, which is a shorthand procedure. It's a small claims procedure for copyright registration and prosecution. So if you have a claim that's worth $15,000 or less, you can apply to this copyright tribunal and have your case heard. You don't need an attorney, it costs you $40 to file. If they accept your case and find you have a valid claim, it's another $60, so it only costs you $100 to assert your rights. And later on in the presentation, I'll give you the website as to where to go to get information on this new, uh, this new procedure, which recently went into effect in April. So as I said, where do, you, where do you go to register your copyright? www.copyright.gov. Now, what does it cost? 
if you're going to go ahead and do, let's say you're going to file uh, the copyright on your novel, it's going to cost you $45. You can either do it by snail mail or you can go ahead and file with the office of the copyright office right on the spot. My suggestion is always that you go ahead and you file online because it takes about 12 months in order for you to get your final copyright certificate. And just merely having that, uh, that receipt from the copyright office indicates that you've got that copyright protection. You don't have to wait for your, your nice frameable certificate. You've already got your receipt in hand. And as I said, it takes 12 months. Um, and so you can see there's some advantages to going ahead and filing with the copyright office. Now, this is the proper template for putting your copyright out into the world. I always tell people, put it on your title page if you are writing a book. Um, if you are sending out a short story, do not send anything out to anyone um, without having this designation on your title page. It's really important. It notifies the world that you know that your property is protected by the copyright law. So we're going to shift gears from the artistic realm to the commercial realm, because we're going to talk a little bit about trademarks. A trademark is a symbol or a word or a logo, which represents a good in the flow of commerce. It's an identifying mark. And if you look at some of the little logos we have here, we have Quaker Oats, we have Visa, we have my favorite Oreo cookies, Pop-Tarts, um, we've got Canon cameras. Those are all logos and designating marks which identify a, a product in the flow of commerce. Now that is, is not under the Copyright Act, it's under the Lanham Act, which is different. And in order for you to obtain a trademark protection, you have to file with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Um, it can be an expensive procedure, again, about $500 to go ahead and submit. It also, there's also a form that they send you that it's not like you color in the exact colors. There's, there's, a, there's symbols and hash marks that you have to put in for each color. So what I usually recommend to people is that they, they contact their state attorney general um, and their a division of licensing, because you can generally license a trademark through your state for a much cheaper cost. And here in New York, it's like 50 bucks to get it done and you've got that mark protected. Now, a service mark is very similar. A service mark represents a service that is rendered commercially. So for example, I belong to Sisters in Crime because I'm a crime writer and I like to keep up on webinars. I like to go to events and I like to network with people. So as you can see, this organization, Sisters in Crime, has a little designating mark there. That's a service mark indicating that they provide goods and services to people. And you can see the difference. R with the circle is a registered trademark. TM, unlicensed trademark, and SM is an unregistered service mark. Now, what does a trademark protect? Well, it protects characters uh, like Winnie the Pooh. We're going to talk about him in a minute. The title of a series. So if you've written a series, like I've written the Queen City Crime series, I could go ahead and get a trademark for my series. Uh, take Diana Gabaldon, for example. She could not get a trademark for Outlander, her first book. But if she calls the series, the Outlander series, she would be able to get a trademark and protect that Outlander series name. Distinctive logos, as we've discussed, and distinctive costumes. So if you're into cosplay or you, know, you, um, you work for a Broadway theater um, and you design a unique costume, like for Wicked, those are all subject to copyright I'm sorry, trademark protection. We're shifting now to our third leg, which is patents. Patents are a protection afforded to scientific innovations, and they only have a life of 17 years, which is why you see a lot of drugs shifting from being a drug that's you know, to, to over the counter. 
um, from you know being a generic it goes from you know the, the licensed drug to a generic drug and then to an over-the-counter medication. There are three types of patents. One is like a um, uh, a design patent, and I always use this as an example. Um, I was looking for a butter dish, and I went on Amazon, and you see we've got this butter dish. They've redesigned this butter dish. They've got you know all kinds of information. It's got little legs and clamps and things like that, and it's got patent pending. So what they did was they reinvented the wheel. They've redesigned the butter dish. Another one is processes. Like I just mentioned before, you know, a um, scientific process, a drug, a, um, uh, you know, a fuel, something along that line that requires manufacturing, that's entitled to patent protection. And the third are asexual plants. So if you create a new bulb, a new tulip, a new rose, you're entitled to patent protection for your new horticultural creation. And again, a patent is required through the United States Patent and Trademark Office. You, you're required to have a patent attorney assist you in submitting that registration. And it can be quite a lengthy procedure. So you see, you see we've talked about the artistic works and copyright, the commercial works and trademarks, and the scientific with patents. Now we're shifting back to copyrights, to the public domain. What is the public domain? The public domain simply means that a copyright has expired. As I said, the life of the artist plus 70 years. Now, every January 1st is considered to be public domain day. That's because a new class of works enter the public domain. This year, works produced in 1925 and prior to that entered the public domain. And what that means is the public can use them, can quote them, can do whatever they want with these works without having to pay a royalty or get permission from the copyright owner because the copyrights have expired. Now, this is the class, an example of some of the class of 2022. We have Winnie the Pooh, we have The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway. We have um, Felix Salton's Bambi, Agatha Christie's The Murder of Roger Ackroyd. This was a big class um, of really well-known works that entered the public domain. So if you want to go ahead and make a movie, you want to go ahead and reprint, republish these works, you can do whatever, what, whatever you want. Take the characters out of them, whatever you'd like with these works. Now, one thing, I want to shift back to Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the, every year there's a group that's called Statistica, and they come up with a list of the top uh, grossing franchises in the world. Now, last year in 2021, number one was Pokemon. Number two, Hello Kitty at $84 billion. Winnie the Pooh was tied number three with Mickey Mouse at $80 billion. Now, the copyrights, as I mentioned, have flown the coop. They've expired. So as a result, the characters of Pooh, Tigger, Piglet, Eeyore, all those characters have entered the public domain, as has the original book. Now, what happened was, as we know, Disney came along. They have made these Winnie the Pooh movies, but they have gone ahead and added new material. So their copyrights are only covering the derivative work. They are those branches that I talked about, not the original work, only the derivative work. So it's a really good example as to the conflict between the uh, copyright work, copyright law, derivative, derivative law, and also trademark law. And I, I also suggest that if you want to go ahead and use Winnie the Pooh, just make sure it doesn't look a lot like uh, Disney's Winnie the Pooh. And also don't hold yourself out as being related to that Disney franchise because you'll get a lot, you'll get into trouble because Disney is very litigious. And they're doing that because in 2027, Steamboat Willie enters the public domain. And we all know that he's the grandfather of Mickey Mouse. So they're out there to protect their rights with Winnie, knowing that they're making the case for when uh, Mickey enters the public domain in a couple of years.
Now, another question arises, suppose I have a copyright or someone else has a copyright as well, and I want to use a portion of their work. Well, if it's for fair use, you're entitled to use it. Now, what is fair use? It's using the material of another person in a commercial environment, provided that it is for non-public, non-profit uses and for criticism or parody. So when the courts look at this question as to has something been used for fair use, was it, they're gonna say, was it used for educational purposes, for criticism, nonprofit purposes? Was the nature of the copyright factual or creative? Generally, the courts will rule in the favor if it is factual. They don't like people using and borrowing from other people's creative products. Also, you have to use a really tiny portion. You can't go ahead and plagiarize whatever you're, you're citing in your, in your workbook or in your, in your own work. And also, does your use have any impact upon the commercial viability of the underlying work? It really cannot. It cannot impact the value that someone else has in their copyright ability. Here are some examples which really kind of drive home. Um, one is Girl Talk. She was a DJ and what she did was she took snippets of other people's songs and matched them up and made her own song. That was held to be fair use. Similarly, a guy who was playing video games that are copyrighted material and then his friends would video him as he would do crazy things while he was going ahead and playing those games. That is also considered a fair use. Think of Ken Burns. Ken Burns goes ahead and makes these wonderful documentaries. And what he does is he takes works that are in the public domain, and he also borrows things that are fair use, things are, that are copyright protected. But what he's doing is he's presenting it for educational, nonprofit pur uh, purposes. So he makes these wonderful documentaries, which are considered fair use. And a really good example is Shepard Fairey. He is a, um, uh, an artist, and some of you may have heard from him, heard of him, but here's a really good example of who he is. I'm sure you recognize his images. Shepard Fairey's is the Obama Hope poster. Now, this, this was a highly litigated case because the photograph belonged to the Associated Press. They brought on an action against Shepard Ferry claiming that he violated their, uh, their copyright, which attached to the, uh, attached the photograph as a derivative work. Shepard Ferry claimed, oh no, it's fair use. I'm, I'm just criticizing, it's fair use. Well, a third party popped up and that's a guy named Manny Garcia. And Manny says, well, wait a second. I was the photographer who took that photograph. I'm, I'm entitled to some kind of uh, damages for copyright infringement. And what the court determined was no. Manny, you were employed, even as a stringer, you are a work for hire. You never owned that image. The image belonged to the Associated Press. So as a result, Garcia was dismissed and kicked out of the lawsuit. But this case was finally settled in 2011 between the AP and Shepard Ferry. So going forward, any posters, any type of, of calendars or postcards that are made and the income that's generated by this Obama image will be split between the parties. So you can see fair use is really a, a very interesting subject for writers to take into consideration. Now, defamation is another buzzword that's been in the news lately. And what is defamation? Well, defamation is when you say something that's knowingly false about someone, okay? And there are two types of defamation. One is libel. Libel is tangible, written form. A magazine, an internet, an article, a blog, an article, or an op-ed. Slander is when you say something false against someone in a speech, on television, um, in a news broadcast. Think of S for slander as speech, okay? Now, we, we all know this has been in the news. It's been hammered into our heads incessantly. And in fact, I, I heard this week that, that she's appealing and now he's appealing. Well, we've got this 
Johnny Depp Amber Heard situation. Now, this case turned on the New York Times versus Sullivan precedent, which held that public officials are held to a stricter level of defamation in order to obtain damages. They have to prove that the words, the bad words and the false words were made with malice. That means that they intentionally knew it was incorrect and they went ahead and they sued anyway. Now we know that Johnny Depp sued for 50 million, he got 15. Amber Heard counter sued for 100 million, she got 2 million. And they're both going back to court, it's crazy. Now, as I said, public officials, officials must show actual malice in order to sustain a case for defamation. Now, as I looked at this case, the question really was, does the First Amendment give too much protection to defamatory speeches? Also, are careless and false statements on the part of the defendant enough to meet that criteria? And was this case looking for truth? Was it really searching out truth or was it simply there to feed the rumor mill um, and Instagram and Facebook and all social media with disinformation? And finally, Johnny Depp won a trial. Amber Heard technically won. Were either of their reputations remedied? by this litigation. This is something I think only time will tell. Now we get to uh, a really favorite topic, which is publishing contracts. Now, what is a publishing contract? A publishing contract is an agreement you enter into with your publishing company, which sets out the rights and obligations that each other has with regard to a specific work. Now, it also clarifies the terms and ensures that both parties' interests are protected and also outlines the terms for termination and also the, the damages in the event that there is a breach. Now, what you have to keep in mind is that these contracts are always drafted in favor of the publishing company. And they don't, they don't, listen to me, they don't expect you to sign the paper that they put in front of you. I know you're all excited, you're gonna be published finally, but don't sign what's put in front of you. First thing you have to do is read it. The second thing is to make notes and ask questions about it. And I'm gonna give you some hints about some of the key provisions that you have to keep your eye on as we go through this. Now, some of the key provisions from an author's perspective is what is the work that's being described in this contract? Is it only one work? Is it um, for a series? Is it any work that mentions the main characters? Does your publishing company have an option on any other work that you produce? And do they, is, is it an exclusive contract? So, the question is, you have to be very careful in reading what is covered, what are you giving away? And when you do that, you have to think in terms of, am I entering into a short-term relationship with this publishing company or a long-term relationship? Remember, this is your career, your writing career. So you have to keep in mind exactly what am I giving away? In regard to that, what rights am I giving away beyond the work? Am I giving them audio rights? Am I giving them book club rights, foreign rights, television rights? What am I giving away? And am I also in within what territory? Is it the United States? Is it the world? Is it only English speaking languages? What is the territory that the, that the publishing company will represent you in? And is it exclusive? Suppose I want to be a hybrid writer. Suppose I want to write thrillers for one company, but then I want to write romance or Regency romances for another company. Can I do that? Those are things that you have to, you have to look at the contract to see exactly what you are giving away. Also, when are you delivering the manuscript? What is the date? Is there, is there a calendar built in there, a production calendar? 
when do you have to go ahead and give it to them? Have you built in a little cushion? Because let's say your kid gets married and all of a sudden you're putting on a wedding or you, you've uh, got a job transfer or you, you've, got a, you've won a trip, you've won the lottery and you can go around the world. Have you built yourself in a cushion that entitles you a little leverage in turning in your manuscript? And who owns the copyright? Never, ever, ever let the publishing company own your, con own your copyrights. And this is something that I learned from experience. When I published my first book, The Midnight Call, I owned the, the, the written uh, copyrights. My publishing company then went ahead and recorded an audiobook. They were the producer and creator of the audiobook, and I was the owner of the underlying materials. Now, I've gone separate ways with them, and I had to get them give, to give me back the, what's known as the P, uh, which is the, the phonographic recording copyrights. Sometimes they're hard to get back. I was very lucky. I was able to retrieve them, but you have to keep that in mind um, that you have to own your copyrights. Most contracts will say that the company will apply for a copyright in the author's name. Do not, do not, do not let them do that. In fact, I and recommending that you don't even submit your final version of your manuscript to them unless you have filed it in the copyright office. Now, on the flip side of the coin are the book publisher's obligations. Let's take a look at those. Now, how and when will publication take place? Will it only, are they doing trade paperback? Are they doing mass paperback, hardback? Are they going to do an audio book? Are they going to do an ebook? All of that should be specified in the agreement. Similarly, the, your, your payments, which are your royalties, will be tied to whatever different type of, of, of publication will occur. So for example, in general, it's a 10 to 15% sliding scale um, of the royalty that the author gets. Um, the author gets at 15%, the rest goes to the publishing company. And we're talking about traditional publishing now and indie publishing. Um, the, for example, then the publisher has to share the, their percentage of the royalty with the production company, with the distribution company. So everybody gets a little piece of the pie, but you want to make sure that you get a royalty. Some publishing companies will give you what's known as an advance. An advance is a lump sum. It can be upon the signing of your contract, or it can be divvied out as you go through the production process, um, which is a credit against any royalties. So that is something that you have to earn back. In other words, let's say that you uh, have a book and you're going to make a dollar on the book and they've given you a $500 royal up upfront advance, you would, have to, you would have to sell 500 books in order to earn back that advance and then start to receive royalties from your publisher. Now, another key provision is advertising promotion. If they're going to put, your, put an ad in the New York Times for you, make sure it's in writing. You want to know whether or not they're going to require you to do marketing. And take it from me, most of your marketing, 90% of your marketing is going to be on the author. The expense and the time and the effort is going to be on you. So uh, just be, if, like I said, if they promise you something, make sure that it's in that agreement. And termination, what happens when this contract isn't working out? What happens when you don't give them a publishable manuscript on time? Or they promise to publish this within six months of the date that of the final approval, the final draft of your, of your uh, manuscript. Suppose they don't do that. Do you have the rights to terminate the agreement? We've just all gone through COVID and there were tons of delays in publication. That's under what's known as force majeure. That's an act of God. How long can a, a publishing company delay publishing your book 
based upon an act of God. Those are things that should be in the publishing contract. Some other key provisions are right to revise the manuscript. You, want, you don't want to submit a manuscript that's about Tom and John and you get it back and it's about Kevin and Jim. You want the, you, this, your name is going on the front. You want the right to revise your manuscript. You also want the right to approve the cover, the title, and the interior design of the book. Often they won't give that to you, but they will give you meaningful and reasonable input in that process. And that's something that's really worth its weight in gold um, for you to be able to contribute to changing and tweaking the cover. It's really a lot of fun. You also want to retain the right to audit. So in the event that they're not giving you the, uh, the royalties that you think you deserve, you want to have the right to send in an account or take a look at your books to just to verify that you're getting the correct amount of royalties. You will, as I said, you want a uh, review of your editorial changes. And generally, when you go through the, the publishing, uh, how can I put this, the publishing rainbow, you're going to have several layers of editorial review. There's going to be developmental edits. There's going to be grammar and spelling edits. edits. Then there's going to be a final PDF edit. You want to make sure that that you have direct input in those in that process so that the book that comes out under your name is as polished and as perfect as you want it to be. Also, another key provision is contracts generally and historically terminate over a certain amount of time. It can be, let's say, a period of two years, even five years, that's negotiated between the parties. But a key term is also when a book goes out of print. We all know today that with an ebook, books last forever. They never go out of print. So what you should do is tie a number of sales of a book to the termination of agreement. In other words, that a book will be considered out of print if it hasn't sold 25 copies in the past six months, something like that. But you have to, if you're going, if that out of print word is in that contract, tie it to something that's definitely finite, a number of books within a certain amount of time. And also double check what costs a publisher can, um, uh, can retain out of your royalties. You know, what expenses can they claim a credit for so as to diminish your royalties? Just be sure of that. So what are some of the do's and don'ts when it comes to a publishing contract? Well, first of all, know your goals as an author. Is it a long-term agreement or a short-term relationship with this publishing company? Is it an exclusive or non-exclusive agreement? That's another thing to keep, keep in mind. Read the entire agreement carefully. I know you're going to read it. You're going to go, oh my God, I don't understand this. It's a lot of dribble but read it because you're able to either ask them or if you get an attorney or if you have an agent, you can ask them intelligent questions. The best thing to do is to be as educated as you can um, and also ensure that the agreement is accurate and reflects your understanding with them. Like I said, if they're gonna take out a full page ad in the Times for you, you want it in that agreement. And don't forget to revise and renegotiate this agreement. Don't put the first piece of paper that they send you, you know, to DocuSign. Negotiate with them. That way they'll understand that you know your rights. And that way you'll get what you want. You may not get everything that you want, but at least you'll, there'll be some give and take and some open communication with your publishing house. And also, once you do sign that agreement, uh, you're probably going to get it in DocuSign, print a copy off, put it with your will, with the title to your car, the deed to your house, with your copyright certificate, because it's a really important document and you want to be able to get your hands on it. The flip side, what are some of the don'ts? Never sign an agreement without revealing it. That goes for everything in life, but never sign a publishing agreement without revealing it. Get everything in writing. Never assume that terms are agreed upon 
unless they're contained in the agreement. And one more thing, do get a lawyer who do have your agent with you. Now, if you're a member of the Authors Guild, and I strongly suggest that people, people join the Authors Guild, there are so many wonderful services that they provide. They do a website for you. They review a contract for you for free. They have forms with the model um, publishing contract on their website. So you'll be able to look at, it, at a model contract and it explains in plain English each and every detail. There's so many things they've got webinars. There's so many things that the Authors Guild has to offer. So if you can't afford an attorney, that's the place to go. Spend 100, 150 bucks, become a member because then you'll get an attorney for free. Another place to go is volunteer lawyers for the arts. Um, I know in New York, we have one that have them all over the country. They're there to help you. So that's another good place to go if you want somebody to review a contract for you. So you see, as we've gone through this kind of enlightening speed, you realize that there's a lot of information that's out there in the public and there are resources that are available to you. There's a lot of information on www.copyright.gov. That's where you can go to find out about that new small claims procedure. They also, you know, that's where the forms are to register your copyright. Um, it's a great resource. Um, if you're interested in fair use, stanforduniversity.edu. As I mentioned, the Authors Guild, they are really worth their weight in gold. If you want to know if something is in the public domain and you want to be able to use it, if you're thinking of citing something in your work, um, you can go to web.law.duke.edu um, and, and they'll have, they have a complete database of, of the works that are in the, the public domain. As I mentioned, the Volunteer Lawyers of the Arts, they're there to help you. Um, and I've written a lot of blogs about the items that we've talked about tonight. So if you want a more in-depth explanation on public domain or the right of privacy or defamation, you can go to my website, which is www.jodymillman.com. Click on the lawyers, uh, the, the Writers Law School, and, and you'll read the blogs there. There's a lot of information for you. So we're kind of coming to the end of the presentation. Um, if you would like a handout which lists the resources that I've discussed and some, some additional ones that I haven't gone through tonight, you can send me an email, <clears throat> excuse me, at jodysusanmillman at gmail.com. Or you can go to my website, Jody Millman, and go to contact me and let me know that you attended tonight's presentation and would like a copy. I'm happy to email it to you. Um, as Miriam said, I'm also a fiction writer. My book, Hooker Avenue, just came out in April. The Midnight Call was released in 2019. It's being re-released um, in September by my new publisher, Level Best Books. You can follow me on Goodreads, Instagram, and Facebook. Now, being a good lawyer, I have to tell you that the information I provided tonight in this presentation is not intended to be legal advice. Instead, it's for educational and informational purposes only. And so I really hope that you've learned a lot. And I see we have quite a few questions. So Miriam, I am going to, I'll go back to this one. And um, would you like to pass along some of the questions to me? Okay, first question is from Deb. Can you apply for a copyright before you finalize the novel's title? If not, and you need to bring legal action in the meantime, can you register after learning of the infringement? That's a very interesting question. Um, you can go ahead and file it and then ultimately change the name. You would have to file a supplemental application changing the name. So you would, instead of paying $45, you end up paying $90 for two applications. I hope that answers the question. But you can go ahead, file, and change the name of your book. Okay, next question. This is from Kathleen. What does a royalty-free image mean? 
A royalty-free image means that you pay a one-time fee um, and you don't have to continually pay a royalty for the use of that image. Now, as I understand it, and I've used, I've used quite a few of them, um, it, it's, the, it's a sliding scale depending upon how much use you're going to make of that particular image. So let's say you want to use it on your website, you're going to use it once, right? You're going to post it once, um, you would pay a certain fee. If you're going to be submitting it to a magazine for printing and publication, there's going to be a lot of duplications of that image. There's going to be a sliding scale. Um, I go to iStock, which has got a great uh, supply of, um, of royalty-free um, images. Um, and they're very reasonable. Maybe it'll cost you 10 or $11, you know, for a royalty for an image, but that's what that means, royalty free. You don't keep paying royalty, you pay one small fee up front. Okay, next question. Why do copyrights expire? What is the purpose of that law? I don't know what the purpose of that is, but I can give you a little history about it. Um, there were no copyrights um, in the United States. And Mark Twain was really the proponent of the original copyright law, which went into effect in 1905. Now, subsequent to that, the law was amended many times. And the most recent amendment was in 1978. Now, in 1978, prior to, works prior to 1978 could be renewed uh, a, for a couple, of, a couple of times. So you're, so, Anything after 1978, the law changed to make it tied to this life of the artist for 70 years. But what's interesting about the 1978 law was that you're going to see works like, I mean, like Mickey Mouse, and you're going to see works like Bruce Springsteen's music and a lot of music that was written prior to 1978. Soon you're going to see that they're not entitled to any further um, extensions of the copyright. And a lot of these very valuable works are going to enter the public domain. And I think that's part of the reason that you see like um, Paul Simon and Bruce Springsteen um, and a lot of these guys offloading their, their, uh, uh, their, uh, their bodies of work because the copyrights are going to be expiring pretty soon. I can't tell you why, but I just thought that kind of gives you a little bit of background um, regarding copyright extensions and the life of the artist. Good question. All right, another question from Deb. Can you apply for a copyright even though you may end up amending the manuscript based on agents or publishers feedback, et cetera? Yes, you can. Um, again, and I recently went through this because when I first finished my manuscript for Hooker Avenue, I went ahead and I sent it into the copyright office um, even before, you know, when I was getting ready to um, send it out to publishers. Then once I, once I was signed with the publisher, I went through this procedure as we talked about, this amendment procedure and, and the developmental edits. And then I can't, so the, 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 the version, the original version had been updated. And I wanted to protect that updated version, which was going to publication, ultimately hitting the market. So I ended up applying for two copyrights, the original. And it will ask you on this form, have you ever applied for a copyright for this before? And you just put in, yes, you know, I'm updating the copyright of whatever year it was. So yes, you can do it. And yes, I recommend doing it. Question from Didi. What, and from Tozen. Same question. Uh, what's your opinion on self-publishing? You know, I don't have an opinion. I think that it depends upon what your goals are. Um, getting published today is very difficult. I mean, we, we all know that. It can be a very frustrating uh, process. It can take years. It took me almost 10 years to get my first book published. And I was already a published author at that point, but I was shifting from nonfiction to fiction. It took about 10 years. And I think that um, you don't get the same uh, care of editing unless you pay for your own editor. Um, you don't get the distribution 
you don't, I mean, you are the chief cook and bottle washer when you go to self-publishing because you're in charge of creating the PDFs, you're in charge of creating the arts, the cover, uh, the distribution, the marketing. I mean, and you know, you just have to balance, do you want to assume that full plate of responsibilities as well as being the writer? You know, and are you in a hurry to get published? You know, I believe there's a publishing company out there for everybody, you just have to look. Thank you, Jody. Uh, next question is from Anne. Thank you for this presentation. How can you protect loved ones within the contract or with a will or trust to ensure that royalties go to them after the death of the author? Well, you would take care of that in your will. You would leave your, um, your copyrights and any royalties to that specific person in your will. It would simply be, it would, I don't know if you have a trust, but I would definitely talk to your attorney to see which is the best. I mean, certainly, you know, another way to go would be to uh, a business, you know, as a writer. And for example, if you, if you have a corporation, then your loved ones could be members of that corporation and they would receive a share of whatever income or in royalties go to that corporation. Um, another way is to create an LLC, which is a limited liability company. And that is, um, that's similar to being one person business, but it, it, it provides you with an umbrella in case you get sued for defamation, frankly. But you can also make um, members of your families partners and agents and managers within that business structure. So it depends how you go, and what type of size of state you have. You can leave it, as I said, quite simply in your will. Um, or you can go ahead, create a family business and just have them from the get-go be involved. Next question is from Yolinda. What about hybrid pub contracts? Does my CR cover an audiobook or other subsequent books? In any event, the terms, what, what is covered, if you wanna be a hybrid author, you have to make sure that your publishing company does not have an exclusive right over all your work. I mean, that's the key. Uh, just defining exactly what is the work that's being, uh, that, that, that you're giving to them, as I said before. You know, if you want to go ahead and write science fiction with one company and children's books with another, you don't want to be precluded by, from, from doing either. So you just have to make sure that whatever agreement you sign is very limited to what works are covered. I hope that's answered. I hope that answered the question. And yeah, she, she meant copyright. Yeah. Okay, next question. Someone wants me to write their story. What are the copyright implications of this? Do they own it because it's their life story or would if I write, or would I, if I copyright the book? Okay, well, well first of all, um, if they are hiring you to write their story, um, I'm, I'm, I don't know what, if they're a ghost writer, you're a work for hire because they are paying you to do the work. Um, if you, if someone is saying to you, hey, I've got a wonderful story, I want you to write my biography and you're writing it as a separate entity. In other words, they're giving you access to their, their life, allowing you to write their story then you are the author. So it all depends on what the financial uh, financial under, understanding and agreement is between the, the object and the writer. So you see there are two different things. One is if you're a ghost writer. The second is if you are the actual writer of that biography. Can that person get a little bit more specific and maybe I could be a little bit more specific? Yeah, um, whoever wrote in that question, if you could be a little bit more specific, type, type it into the Q&A box. Um, but we'll move on to the next sure. question. Um, another question from Anne. If you post original work on a social media platform and don't put the copyright line you suggested, 
what is the worst that can happen? I remember a rumor about Facebook claiming ownership of photos posted. Well, that's a very good question because under the, um, under the Copyright Act, they've created what's known as a group copyright registration. So if within a three month period, you publish posts online um, or you write a group of poems or whatever, anything that's published online within three months and contains up to 17,500 words can be lumped together in one package and sent off to the Copyright Office for one copyright registration, which is $65. Um, there's also um, the digital, the Millennium Digital Act, which is a very complicated act that protects people from stealing others' um, information and posts off the internet and off websites. Um, and there's, that's like a whole, I could give a whole lecture about that digital stealing. Um, but there is a law that's out there that allows you to protect yourself. Basically, you have to find out the ISPN of the, of, the, of the person who's infringed you, and then you have to notify the host. I mean, it's very convoluted, but there are protections out there under this digit, Millennium Digital Act. I'm sorry, that's the best I can do with that question. <laughs> okay, um, going back to the, the previous question. Um, so they said, getting more specific, this is a niece of a notorious bank robber. She is the last living relative of her family and wants me to write a book about their life of crime. This would not be as a ghostwriter, my name would be on it but she's thrown out numbers like going 50-50. Okay, well, what she would have to do is enter into an agreement with them so that if they're providing you this access, that would make sense that they would be taking a certain percentage of whatever the royalties are. Um, um, sounds like an interesting project. Sounds like a really interesting project. And you know, there's, uh, there are quite a few presses that specialize in these crime, these true crime, which is a really big, you know, big genre today. So that, that sounds like an interesting project, but, but get it in writing. And to some degree, you would be entering into what's known as a partnership with them. And that means that you're going to go into the understanding, setting out your rights and obligations so that should you get into a fight or should you decide that the project isn't working, um, but, but one of you wants to continue on with the project, you'll be able to establish what those rights and obligations are with regard to each other. You should definitely um, you know, get an attorney if you're seriously thinking about proceeding with that project. And Jody, I have a couple of questions about ISBN numbers, if you could talk a little bit about that. You know, I don't really know that much about them. Um, so I prefer not to go there, to be honest with you. That's generally, I can tell you, it's generally something that's done for you by your publisher. Um, I don't know if, how you do it if you're going to be self-published. Um, but that is something I will have to look up because that's, that's the first time I've ever been asked that question. So I will definitely look it up. And I will do a blog about it. So there you go. I'll do a blog about it. You can go over to my website and you'll get the information. I'm going to make a note. And on speaking about blogs, um, Patricia is asking if should blog posts be copyrighted? Like I said, you can go ahead and do this group registration of copyrights, okay? And so if you published your blogs within three months and with a maximum of 17,500 words, you can go ahead and protect them. And I would recommend that you do protect them because you spent a, a lot of time either researching and writing. And it's just like, I mean, they're like novellas really. So you would want to protect those. You would want to protect a poem. You would want to protect a short story. So I would recommend that you go ahead and protect it. 
And then if you run into any trouble or somebody tries to steal it, you've got the protection of this Digital Millennial Act, which uh, uh, you know, prevents people from taking your blog and claiming it to be their own. A question from Shavon. I'm writing an autobiography which does not paint some family members in the best light. Do I need the permission of those family members or do I need to change their names in order to avoid any issues? That is a very common question and a very difficult, I'm gonna give you a very difficult answer. The, the answer is never write anything disparaging about anybody. Because if you do, you are opening yourself up to defamation, a defamation lawsuit. Um, you know, you could sit down with the, with the member of the family and say, look, you know, I'm telling this story, this, this is the autobiography, and get them to sign a release. But the release may or may not hold water. I got to tell you now, depending upon what you say. So that is a very tricky area. Um, if you were writing a novel, what I would say um, was that go big or go home. In other words, when you describe someone, if it's, if it's modeled after a real life person, you have to exaggerate that personality so that people won't know where the line between fact and fiction is. But if you're writing an autobiography, you know, people are relying upon you for the truth. Um, very tricky area, and I think a very dangerous area. There are some attorneys who do nothing but vet um, manuscripts. So that's another thing you can do, and I know you can find them through uh, the lawyer, the, the author's guild, because I sat through a presentation from one of them. But if you're worried about it, you know, if you want to go ahead, write your story, and then you get it vetted to make sure that you don't get sued. But that is a very, very tricky area, very tricky area. Sorry. And one last question. Okay. A lot of people want to know your thoughts on ghostwriters. Ghostwriters. Um, again, you're a work for hire. You know, you're never going to get the claim that, you know, your hard work has gone into. You know, they'll think that Matthew McConaughey wrote the book when actually you wrote the book. Um, that's all personal preference. If you want to get the writing experience, it might be a good way to get writing experience. It would be like becoming James Patterson's, you know, writing buddy. Uh, you'd be getting experience, but as far as being able to claim it on your resume, you'll never be able to do that. So it depends where you are in your career and what your goals are and whether or not you really need money. There you go. <laughs> Okay, I think that's, I think that's a great answer. Well, Jody, I think that we are going to conclude the program. I want to thank all of our guests for those wonderful questions. Um, and thank you, Jody, for answering them. I, I hope that everybody got uh, the answer that they were looking for. Um, thank you, Jody, for this wonderful and informative presentation. Um, I think of a very complicated um, subject, but very important for anybody who wants to be a writer or be in that creative uh, industry. Again, thank you, Jody, so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. You ask great questions, really thoughtful questions. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jody. Have a thank great Thank you. Enjoy your summer. <laughs>